Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you all. Turn to the person next to you and say, smile. It's been raining all week. The sun's been out. Smile. Come on. I want to welcome you all to Parkside Community Fellowship. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up as we begin. So if the praise team could join me. And we want to welcome you all. We will welcome you again a little bit later. But let's just bow our heads for prayer as the praise team comes up. Father, thank you for this day that you have given us to give you glory, honor, and praise for all that you have done for us. We pray now that as we worship you, that your Holy Spirit will abide with us, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise team will now lead out. Good morning, everyone. All right. I'm not going to ask you to do it again. Because um, that, was, that was the real one. <laughs> that was the real one. How are how we, how we doing this week? Um, how have we been doing this week? Okay. Fantastic. Amen. Um, who had a really great week? Amen. Nice one, Melissa. Yes, Clint, nice. Who had um, an okay week? It was kind of to be expected, like it was along the lines of normal. Anyone? Yeah? All right. Thank God for those as well. <laughs> um, who had a challenging, a challenging week? Yeah, yeah, a couple of hands. Dare I say we thank God for those as well? <laughs> we thank God for those as well and, and um, we just want to thank God in the good and the bad the Bible tells us that in everything there is a season yeah. right um, so if it was a challenging week then it could be just that that's the season mm. but if we, if, we, if we carry God with us and we take him into our challenges then it will all turn out for our good. That's what the Bible says, right? Yeah. That's going to work out. So, so the challenge that is challenging is good for you. It's like taking a pill, take, taking medicine. We don't like taking um, our herbs, but it does our body good, right? Um, so we thank God for the good. We thank God for the challenges. And we thank God for the times when he allows us to just, just go through. <laughs> um, we are here in the house of the Lord to, to give God some praise is that right? yeah? okay now I don't know how many of you had the opportunity or if you did get the opportunity you chose to give God praise in the week um, but we have an opportunity right now alright so I want us to think about how good God has been and even through the challenging times how he has brought us through okay um, and I want you to think about being a vessel for the Lord. How many of us want to be a vessel for the Lord? Think about it before you put your hands up. Because it's a, it's, it's a big thing. All right. Um, but the Bible says that we are his temple. Um, and at one point he told the, uh, the, the children of Israel to to make him a sanctuary that he may dwell amongst us as humanity. But then later on we're told that our bodies are a temple of the Lord and that um, if we so allow it, he will come and dwell in us. So we're going to sing a song and as we sing this song, I want you to, because I like it at parts of when we greet each other, okay? So I will always try and get that in. Um, so I want us to get up, and I want us to greet each other whilst we sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. 
because if I did read you correctly, that's your wish. Amen? All right, so when you shake somebody's hand, just congratulate them for being the sanctuary of the Lord. Amen? And then obviously ask their name if you don't know their name. All right, everybody stand to your feet. As soon as we start singing, I want you to cross and go and greet. Let's go. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. To be a sanctuary. Pure and holy. Pure and holy. Tried and true. Tried and true. And with thanksgiving. And with thanksgiving. I'll be a living. I'll be a living. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. For you. For One more time. You. Lord, prepare me. What you want me to be? What you want me to be? Say more me. me. What you want me to be? What you want me to oh, be? Say more me. Yes. Me. What you want me to be? What you want me to be? Say more me. me. What you want me to be? What you want me to be? And we say yes. Sing, Lord, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Amen. We're just gonna sing. We're just gonna sing a prayer right now that simply just says, "Open the eyes of my heart, Lord." Now, what does it mean to open the eyes of your heart? The last I checked, our hearts do not possess eyes. True. So, what does it mean to open the eyes of my heart? Because you know the Bible says that our hearts are wicked. Deceitful. So as we sing this song, I want you to think about our intentions, our thoughts. And then we want God to open so that we can see, we can feel what the Lord desires for us in our hearts and in our minds. Sing along with me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. You know the song? Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let me hear you sing it. Open the eyes, yes. Come on, tell him. I want to. One more time, sing. 
Sing that one more time, one more time. Let me hear you. Open me eyes, yes. Sing it like you mean it. Open. I want to. I want to, yes. Let's join in. Open the eyes. Open the eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Sing what? Just like the angels do. Let's sing that one more time. To see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, we want to pour out your power. Pour out your power as we sing. As we sing, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. I want to see. Just raise your hand if you want to see him. I want to see Not only in your heart yes. I want to see But you want to see him in your workplace I want you to You want to see, see him in your relationship in your marriage I want to see You want to see him in your children I want to see you You want to see him in yourself I want to see you. Last time I want to I want to see Okay, we're just going to sing a song that just says, shout to the Lord. All the earth, let us do what? Sing, sing power and majesty. and majesty. Do we believe his majesty or do we believe in his majesty or do we believe he has majesty? Um... Because I, I believe that, depending on how strongly we believe how majestic and his, how powerful he is, kind of affects how we approach and do life, right? Um, because we're all going through stuff. Whether, you know, you leave your home and you go to work and you face it there, or you come home and you face it there. But we're all going through stuff, right? So, I want you to sing the song and just, just put yourself in the center and just sing to him as if you really believe in how majestic he is and how powerful he is and let that see everything through those lens, those lenses, that, that lens. Is that, a, let's try and do that, yeah? 
My Jesus. Let's sing. My Jesus. My Savior. My Savior. Lord. how you're feeling this should be our thought process we should always say my comfort and he is your shelter believe that he is your tower let your breath everything that you are say to yourself you will never Yes. Lord, there is none. Tell him there is none like you. All of my days. Do you really want to praise? What are you going to praise? Let's join in. Let's all sing together. He is my comfort. My comfort. What else is he to you? My shelter. What else? Tower, refuge, and strength. Right. Let every breath. Let every Each breath. Each and every one of us. All that I am. All that I am. What will we do? Never cease to worship. That's it. Let's sing together. Let's sing together. Shout to the Lord. Yeah. 
One more time. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that nothing compares to the promise? Now, somebody give me a promise. Shout it out. Amen. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Another promise. And they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And they shall call his name Jesus. What a promise. Another promise. What promises do we have in the Lord? He's coming back. Hallelujah. One more promise. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And the beautiful thing about that is he says, if I go, then I will come. Did he go? Okay, then the rest is done. Now, we're moving into um, a, a different season at Parkside where the theme is transformation. And I don't know about you, but I can do with some transformation. I can do with some changing. Um, and so we're going to sing a song. We're going to sing a, a, we're going to have a theme song for this theme. And this song is taken from Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. Where the Lord tells us that, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and an expected end. Somebody should have said amen. Right. So, when God says he has a plan for you, do you believe him? Do you trust him? Okay. So, that's one of our promises. The, one of our promises, the Lord says, not just that I have a plan for you, but I know what it is. And if he has a plan and he knows what it is, he says he will cause it to pass. And so as we go through this theme of transformation, I want you to keep in, in your minds, at the forefront of your minds, that because he has a plan for you, he also has a duty to transform you. It's part of the process. In order for you to enter into your calling, he has to mold us and shape us and dare I say transform us so it's a simple song um, hopefully you'll catch it quick but I want you to think that there are times I want you to know we all know there are times when we are down there are times when we feel like there's no one around we feel like we're all by ourselves even though we may be here amongst brethren our friends, our family, but we, we may still feel alone. I want you to take comfort that he knows the plans that he has for you. It's a very simple song. We'll sing it for you. Let's sing, When You're Down. When you're down Slip down a little bit. Your world is just falling apart. Your world's apart. I want to encourage you to trust, trust in, the Lord. in the Lord. Why? Because He has. He has a plan. And because He has a plan, He'll see you through. Just trust His heart. Trust in His heart. Let's sing that one more time. When you're down, you got it? When? When you're down. And there's no one around. It seems like, it seems like, it 
seems like your world is just falling apart. Your world's apart. I want to encourage you to trust. Trust in the Lord. Why? Because he has a plan. He has a plan. And he will see you through. He'll see you through. Trust in the heart of the Lord. Trust in his The next part says, the Lord says, I know. I know. For you. Not to harm you. Who says that? That's one of our yay and amen promises. I know. Plans to give you hope. And a future. If only. Only you know the heart of the Lord. You know my heart. When you cannot see him in your situation, will you trust his heart? When you can't feel him around you, will you trust his heart? Amen. Let's go. When you're down. When you're down, let's sing. When you're down. you know the heart of the Lord, you won't fear again. Yeah. You won't faint, you know? Oh, my heart. So when you're in that deep, dark time and you can't feel him, you know just trust heart. the heart of the Lord. Last time. Let's sing together. You know my heart. You know my heart. So as we move into the time of prayer, we're just going to um, I want you to think about all of those things that you wish to put before the Lord. Um, and I'm also going to give you an opportunity to come up if there's anything specific that you want to pray you want to be put before the Lord, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to the front. Just say, pray for me as Derek leads us in a time of prayer. As we sing this song, if you feel to come to the front for special prayers, please pray. Father, he is the ancient of days. The ancient of days. Pray, pray. Pray always. Pray always. Speak to him. Speak to your father. The ancient. The ancient. 
ancient of days. As we sing one more time, pray. Pray, pray. If anyone has a special pray, request, pray, speak to your father. Speak to your father. For he is the ancient of days. The ancient of days. Pray. Something that you know could not have been done by any other means. It had to be God. A life-changing, circumstance-changing situation. If that's you, if that's ever happened to you, I'd like you to stand. For those of us who have not had such an experience, I would just like you to... Look around you. See what God has done. And what God continues to do in our lives. Life changing. That's the God that we serve. Yep. Now some of us standing here are going through other life changing situations. Some of us watching at home are going through life changing situations. But I want you to know there's a witness here in this church in Parkside. That God is able to deliver us from whatever challenges and circumstances we find ourselves in according to his excellent greatness and according to his mercy. We have no need to doubt yes. because we are living witnesses that God is able. Yes. Not only that he's able, that he's willing and able. Yes. That he considers us to be his children. Yes. And he will withhold no good thing from his children Hallelujah. because he loves us Hallelujah. more than we can ever know. Someone said, if you want to understand how God loves us, look down at your feet. That's the distance in which you can love God. Now look up into the heavens, and that's the distance he can love you. Our God is a mighty God, a powerful God. Yes, he is. We only fail when we choose not to believe he can deliver us. Let's hold on to God. As he rebuilds the altars in our lives, let us draw close to him. So that he can bring fire from heaven yes. and bless us and heal our land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are living witnesses that you are just God, that you are a merciful God, that you are an able God, that you are all forgiving God, that you are God, Lord, who loves us with an unimaginable love, that you are God that doesn't look at our faults, but looks at our future. A God that sees us for who we will be, not for who we are at the moment. Lord, you know our circumstances, you know our situations. But we also know, Lord, that you know how to get us out of them. Lord, you know how to make a way out of nowhere, because that's your job, that's your business, that's what you do. You are God of the impossible. Possible is just too easy for you. You don't waste your time on possible, Lord. You're a God of the impossible. Lord, we need to be faithful in our asking. Not doubting that you can't, but just believing that you will. In your time, you will deliver us because that's your promise to us. Draw nigh unto me, you said, and I will draw nigh unto you. I know what you need. I've already provided it for you. You just need to ask and it's there, it's yours. When I stand at the door and knock, open up, let me in. I've got blessings upon blessings, Lord. Blessings upon blessings. My God is able to give us all that we need and more. We just need to believe. And in the storm, we need to hold on. And not think that we can get out of that boat. But stay in the boat. Stay with God. Allow him to calm the storm. Allow him to get us to the other side. Allow him to bless us. To bless our families. To bless our finances. To bless our relationships. To bless our work colleagues. To bless us on the road. To bless us at home. To bless us in all situations, Lord. Some it's hard to believe it because we waited so long and we haven't seen it. 
to understand that our time is not your time. It can be hard, Lord. Some of us are asking, when? When? When is it going to be my time? And for those, Lord, I pray that you will give us a double portion of your spirit, of your patience. But most of all, Lord, I want you to let us know that you hear us, that you're with us. As we walk through these challenges of life, that you got us, that you got this, that we can be a living testimony of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And so that we can be a powerful witness to our friends and our family and to each other, that we serve a living God who's coming back to take his children home, to do away with this world of sin, to recreate us, Lord to refine us and renew us and take us to our heavenly home, Lord. Help us to walk with joy in our hearts, despite our challenges. To speak with power and confidence when we talk about our God. Not to be meek, not to be fearful, but to go forth with boldness and say, I'm a child of the King. Let me introduce you to the man I know, the God that I serve, the Deliverer, our friend and our King. Be with us now, I pray, Lord. Be with the speaker for today, Lord. I pray that you will bless her heart. As you've been working with her today and this week, Lord, I ask that you will provide her with a double portion of your blessing right now. That the words that she speaks will be straight from your throne of grace, Lord, and you will deliver them with power. And that we will hear and be transformed and accept your grace to grow and then to glow, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How are we all? It's very good to see all of you. Just look to the person next to you. Just have a look at them. They might look nice in their church clothes today. A smile on their face, maybe. Small smile. Smile back at them. Go on. A day. It's good to be in God's house this morning. You're all looking radiant. Extra moisturizer on today. Hair freshly slicked. I see the girls at the front looking very fresh in their trainers. It's good to be in God's house because he's been good to us. But most importantly, the people that you're looking at today are going to look very, very different over the next quarter. Why, Melissa, you ask? We are on a journey of transformation. What did I say? Transformation. We're on a journey to do three things. And we are very excited because Pastor Fuller, um, in his vision and through prayer, um, has decided that we're going to be on a journey together. And we have some speakers amongst us who will be guiding us over the next quarter on a journey of transformation to do these three things. To grow, to glow, and to... What was the last one? Y'all forgotten? You're going to look at the flyer. Anyone? Grace to grow and to glow. Three things. Grace to grow and to glow. And so you all look like this today. But I promise you, at the end of this quarter, you're going to be looking a little different. And the reason for this transformation is not going to be because you put an extra bit of gel on the edges to keep them slicked down. It's not going to be because you've ironed your shirt on the front and the back, not just, you know, on the front, maybe, or in your jacket. Men, I know the games. I know what you do. But actually, it's going to be on the inside. We're praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the lives of our children, in the lives of our singles, in the lives of our families, in the lives of all all of us to be entirely transformed by the end of this quarter. Do you believe God is able, anyone? God is able. And what we're looking for in our journey of transformation is that each one of us have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And in that personal encounter, we're going to learn more about him. We're going to learn what it means to be loved by God. We're going to learn what it means to experience his grace and his favor. We're going to learn how to repent. Anyone want to learn how to repent properly? How to be free from sin, not to have guilt anymore, to be weighed down so you can walk in a little taller. You can go around with a smile on your face. But then also, most importantly, to be equipped to go forward and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in your own special way. It's not going to be the way that I do it or the way that our singers do it, but in your own unique way, we are going to experience a transformation. And so if you have been called by Pastor Fuller to be a speaker for this series, please stand up. 
please stand up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Okay, amen. We've got our homegrown, plus me and pastor. Take your seats, thank you. We've got our homegrown um, quintuplet, is what we call ourselves? A five. <laughs> five of us who will be leading this um, series over the next quarter. We haven't flown in anyone from America, unfortunately, but we have flown us in from Reading and the surrounding areas. And so we can speak specifically to your struggles and to your challenges. And we're excited. And most importantly, we are praying for each and every one of you that God would do something incredible in each of your lives. Amen. Amen. So there were a few announcements that Uncle Steve also asked me just to share, um, and they are the following. Who parked their car in our unique parking lot today? Raise your hand if you parked your car in our, amen, for our parking lot, amen. It's just for us. Um, so please make sure you validate your parking, otherwise there'll be a bill coming to you that you didn't expect. So make sure you validate your parking. And I'm going to invite Auntie Donna up now to do... Oh, it's somebody else. The health spot. Who is on the health spot team who's coming forward? Auntie John is looking up at somebody. Oh, it's you, Auntie. Come forward, please. And then we will have our offering just after you. Thank you. Good day, church. Sabbath to you all. Um, due to the short notice, I would not be able to put my slides up because I did prepare some slides. But um, hopefully you can follow from what I say. And I will try to have a, a handout prepared, which I can give to you subsequently, maybe next week or the following week. So I'm dealing with water, the benefits of water. And we know that approximately 60 to 70 percent of our body mass is made up of water. And this includes the skin, tissues, cells, and other organs. Without water, nothing lives. The female, the average um, composition of the female body of water is 60 percent, and males, it's about 65 percent. Now, in terms of the importance of water, you can survive for three weeks or more without food, but only an average of three days without water. But those who have been fully hydrated before they have a shortage of water available may survive for about eight to 10 days without water. A person can lose all their fat and carbohydrate reserves and about half of the body's protein without being in any real danger. But a loss of about 22% of body weight in water is fatal. We lose an average of 2.5 liters, that's about 10.6 cups of water per day, through urine, bowel movements, perspiration, and through breathing. Therefore, it is important to replenish the body by drinking water and other beverages that contain water. Drinking water should be clean, and pure, as contaminated water can cause diseases such as cholera, typhoid, gastroenteritis, and leprospirosis. Now, the breakdown of water in the body um, that goes in and out is about 2.5 liters. Now, water keeps us from being dehydrated. And we know also that coffee and alcohol are dehydrating. So if you use alcohol and coffee, you will be more dehydrated. Dehydration is a condition in which the body does not have enough water to supply or to support the vital organs and the vital body functions. Water removes toxins and waste products from the body, thereby cleansing it. And hydrotherapy is a skill that is used by many to help to remove certain illnesses and to cause people to recover from certain illnesses as well. But um, the, the topic of water is very wide and we won't be able to cover all of that today. But what is required to process all the nutrients from the food that we eat and carry the assimilated nutrients to the cells by circulating through the lymphatic system. Drinking an adequate amount of water daily is important for overall good health because water aids in digestion circulation, absorption, excretion, and regulating body temperature. 
Water moisturizes the skin. Dry, dry skin has less resilience and elasticity, and it is more prone to wrinkling and to other skin problems. Now, the unfortunate truth is that water reaches all the other organs before it reaches the skin. And the brain has the first priority over water. So if you, have, you don't have enough water in the system, the, the brain takes the priority of accessing whatever water is in the system because of all the functions that the brain has to perform. Now, lack of hydration in the skin turns it dry, tight, and flaky. Drinking enough water combats skin disorders like psoriasis, wrinkles, and eczema, and is more important than applying topical creams, okay? Water energizes food, which is why food without water has absolutely no energy value for the body. But you should drink water only like 30 minutes before eating or one hour after eating so that you will not interfere with the digestive process. Water transports all substances inside the body, increases the efficiency of the red blood cells, takes oxygen to the cells, and wastes gases to the lungs for disposal. It reduces also DNA damage. Water clears toxic waste from different parts of the body and takes it to the liver and kidneys for disposal. Water is a main lubricant in the joint spaces and helps prevent arthritis and back pain. And it cushions spi um, spinal discs. It is also the best lubricating laxative and prevents constipation and clogging of the arteries in the heart and the brain. It reduces the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Water gives us power and electrical energy for all brain functions, particularly thinking for neurotransmitters, including serotonin, for the production of all hormones made by the brain, including melatonin, and that's helpful for sleep, good sleep. Restores normal sleep rhythms and reduces fatigue. Water can help prevent attention deficit disorders in adults and children. It can help to expand the attention span, reduce stress, anxiety, and depression, reduce memory loss as we age. And note that as you get older, your sensation for thirst diminishes. So elderly people should be reminded to drink water because they don't tend to feel thirsty. Reduce the risk, it also helps to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. Water helps reverse addictive urges, including those for caffeine, alcohol, and some drugs. Dehydration prevents sex hormone production, one of the primary causes of loss of libido and impotence. Water will clear up toxic sediment deposits in tissue spaces, joints, kidneys, liver, brain, and skin. Water reduces the incidence of morning sickness in pregnancy, and it decreases menstrual pains and hot flashes. Water separates the sensation of thirst and hunger, and drinking water on time is one of the best ways of losing weight without much dieting. I'm coming to an end. Water dilutes the blood and prevents it from clotting during circulation, and it makes the immune system more efficient to fight infections and cancer cells where they are formed. Water helps prevent glaucoma, normalizes blood manufacturing systems in the bone marrow, thereby helping to prevent le leukemia and lymphoma. Lack of water in the body can cause constipation, asthma, allergies, hypertension, migraines, and ma many other health conditions. Now, in the book, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty, the author mentioned so many sicknesses that people think are real sicknesses, but it's actually caused from dehydration. So water is an absolute necessity. Life, water is life. Drink six to eight cups of water daily, or one cup for every 15 pounds of body weight. And an extra cup or two, if you're a manual worker, if you're playing sports or when you're exercising, or during the summer months, or if you reside in a tropical country. And if you have problems with drinking water and you don't drink enough, you might want to also add some other healthy things that can make your water more hydrating and 
and help you to feel more comfortable drinking. Things like cucumber, because it cools and hydrates. Lemon or lime juice, it boosts immunity and prevents cold. You can add ginger, it, it warms the body and aids digestion. You can add cinnamon in limitation. It regulates blood sugar and reduces cholesterol. Fresh mint freshens the breath and treats nausea. Chia seeds strengthens the teeth and bones. Aloe vera juice relaxes and relieves stress and also herbal teas. And honey can prevent cancer and infections and berries to promote beauty and prevent oxidation. So this is just a little tip of the iceberg. I can speak for a whole month on water, but I hope that you'll benefit something from this and it will help you. Amen. Amen, amen. Irene has an announcement, so she comes forward. But yes, we are inspired to keep our bodies and our temples hydrated. Thank you. Can I get all the ladies to just give me a quick wave, please? Okay, there's quite a few of you. So on behalf of the Women's Ministry, we're organizing our first social event. It's gonna be called Paint and Prosper. So it's a sip and paint style. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but essentially we're all gonna be around, have our canvases, painting. It's a time for us to come together and get to know one another a bit more. Um, the details, so it's going to be, let's see. It's going to be next Sunday from one to four at Reading Central Church in Taha, so in the back hall. Um, we sent out a poll a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if some of you have seen it, I know, I'm aware that not all of you are on the group. So if you are interested and want to join, please let me or one of the women's team members know. Can I just get all the women's, everyone in the women's team, can you just give a big wave so everyone can see? So these are who you should be speaking to if you are interested. So again, that's next week from one to four at Reading Central Church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so as we move on, it's time for our tithes and our offerings. And as we think about this idea of transformation, um, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 9 and 10, a really interesting promise. I'm not sure how many of you, when it comes to giving your tithes and offerings, are intentional about how much you're going to give. If you think in advance of Sabbath coming, what money you're gonna put aside to put in the offering basket, or if you're kind of just kind of searching around or waiting for the spirit to move on, this, on the morning to see how much you're gonna tap that day. But as we're thinking on our journey of transformation over this quarter, I want to challenge us to think in advance about giving God something specific on that Sabbath morning tithing and our offering, thinking specifically about what we want to give and setting that aside. The reason for this is because we're in a cost of living crisis and God has a solution. And he says in verse nine of Proverbs chapter three, if you're ready, I'll read it. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Now, I'm not sure how many of us are gardeners here or have room um, to grow anything, but if your first fruits are perhaps your salary dropping on the first of the month or the end of the month, think about as soon as that salary drops, thinking about what you're gonna give to God. That's your first fruit. Take that out and put it aside in a little monzo pot or something. Um, and then verse 10 says, and then, your barns will be filled with plenty. Who would like plenty? Anyone? Me personally, Jesus, me. Um, will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, I don't know if we have barns or vats for wine, but I'm sure God can help our bank balance. Amen, somebody. When we honor him with the first fruits of our, our goods. And so I'm gonna challenge you again in this quarter, just try God. Ask him to prove himself to you in his generosity, in his abundance as we're faithful with our tithes and offerings. We've got our two handy card reading holding friends at the back, Jolene and um, JP. And so they're, they're available. If you're online and you want to give your offering and here at Parkside, then we can share those details. They may well be in the description. Um, and I'm just going to pray in advance for the offering and then we can invite the praise team forward to sing. Okay, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we want to prove you now. Help us, Lord, to have the willingness to have the lack of fear, to trust you with the first fruits of our offering. Father, um, you give us so much. You give us life and health and 
all these things that we can't even quantify, God. But Lord, we want to be faithful in returning to you what's yours and also to demonstrate that we honor and respect all that you've given us by taking something from our own to give back to you. And um, we're returning our offering, returning our tithes, Father. Help us to do this diligently, faithfully, and intentionally over this quarter as we prove you now. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Praise team, please come forward. All right, so as we take, <clears throat> collect our tithes and offerings, we're just going to sing like the dew in the morning. Gently rest upon my heart. Here we go, let's sing. Like the dew. Like the dew in the morning. Gently rest. Gently rest upon my heart. One more time, like the June. Nice. Gently. Like the Jew, your turn. Beautiful. Like the Jew. Gently rest. All right, gentlemen, it's your turn. Let's sing. Like the Jew. Like the Jew. There we go, there we go. You hear that, women? There's men in the house. Come on. Like the G. Like the G. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's sing together. Whoa! seated we've already prayed for the offering now it's time for the children's story so if you're a child or childish please come forward to the front 
as we have a children's story by me. Dylan, come on this side. You can sit here. Come closer, come closer, come closer. You two grown now? Okay, I can see you. It's fine. Uh, I can pull a chair. Good morning, children. Good morning, children. Hi. You guys are too grown, aren't you? These three girls at the front, they're looking extra grown today. But it's okay. You can, you're still kind of children, so it's fine. Um, can I have one of my pictures on the screen? Who knows? It really looks as if it's um, just a light. Yeah. What about you? It's, ba it's, basically, it's, basically, it's basically a fly that glows at night. Yeah, it's so cool. Go on. I've seen one before. Where did you see it? Um, in Uganda. In Uganda. Wow, you tropical children be traveling, traveling. So today's story is about a firefly, um, and you're going to learn some interesting facts. And so let's go. The story is told of a firefly, and her name was Luna. Now, Luna was different from other fireflies because she had a special gift that allowed her to shine brighter than any of the other ones. One evening, she was going through the forest, and she saw a tree. And underneath that tree was a book. And no surprises, it was a Bible, because it's our children's story. And so, in her Bible, she read the pages and read about this angel. Does anyone know of an angel that was in heaven, but fell because he had lots of pride in his heart? Do you remember what his name might have been? Michael? No, the other one. Gabriel? The other one. <laughs> you guys are good, though. Lucifer? Lucifer, that's right. And so she read about this guy called Lucifer in the book of Isaiah. And she heard that he was this great angel and had loads of power. He had a beautiful voice, but he had pride in his heart. What is pride? What's pride? What might it look like if you've got a lot of pride or you're a proud person? When you think you're better than everybody else. I like that one. What else? Uh, what, what, when, you're, when you want to be like someone. In this case, it worked for Lucifer because he wanted to be like God. Can any of us actually be God? We can be similar to him or be in his image, but not to be God. He wanted to have power and be like God and for anyone to like worship him. But that's not right, is it? And so she read about this guy called Lucifer and she read that he had turned away from what was good to what was evil. And so... As she was reading, she thought about, wow, he had light and I have light. Maybe my light can be used for good and evil, just like his light could be used for good or evil. And she decided deep in her heart that she wanted to make a choice and live for the light. But she also wanted to learn about why she glowed. Because if you have a look in this picture, this is what it's like when you see fireflies. Like, that's not made up. When they're at night, they, like, sparkle, and it looks really magical. And so she was like, it's really cool that I have this power, but how does it even happen? Anyone have any guesses? What makes a firefly glow instead of just, like, a bee and a beetle? What, what, any ideas what might be happening in their bodies? Can I have a guess? Pro probably there's this, like, type of acid. Ooh, tell me more. Um, uh, that, that makes the firefly, uh, that make that, that, that is that has enzymes which make which make the firefly glow. Round of applause! Round of applause. a future scientist here. Go on. Maybe the reflection of the um, the sun bounces off them at night. Ooh, I love these theories. Oh, coming back, we've got a revision to the hypothesis. N not not the sun, the moon at night. The moon at night. I like your idea. Go on. Um, I think like there's a hole on top of it, and then something reflects and makes it shine as if like uh, as if um as if you put something metal at the moon and it shines oh, these are really good theories but guess who was closest it was you well done so i'm going to tell you exactly about that enzyme that was so clever so in luna's body she found out that there's an enzyme called luciferase this is real luciferase is the enzyme inside her body and so, inside her body, when she beats her wings, I like a little dance, yeah, you're right. <laughs> when she beats her wings, oxygen reacts with luciferinase in her body, and she's able to produce 
do a chemical reaction and produce a brilliant light. Wasn't he good? Give him a round of applause again. Wow. <gasps> Can't wait for you to be a scientist. Fantastic. So she realized she had in her body power to do something bright and good and she decided she didn't want to have pride in her heart she wanted to use her power for good and so she made a solemn promise to herself in a song what song might it be what song might she sing have a guess what songs really good related to this children's story if you were writing this children's story what would it be glowing glowing i don't know that one what about what song could we sing about light uh, should we sing it? Okay. Are we going to sing it? Ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, what were you going to say? This little light of mine. Yeah. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, oh yeah. Well done, thanks for helping my story. And I wanna know, are you guys gonna let your light shine? Because you too have a light inside of you. I mean, your bums don't glow like this, thankfully, but inside you, there's a light. That's because God lives in each of you. There's gonna be people who wanna dim your light, tell you you're stupid tell you you're not good enough, tell you you're not smart, but we've already seen you're super smart and super great with loads of ideas. So we're going to pray that God helps us to keep our light shining. Anyone want to pray for me today? Okay, it's going to be me. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for our bright, sparkling children. Thank you that your Holy Spirit lives in them and that their light can shine, Father, so that everyone can see that they're your children and glorify their Father in heaven. Help them, Lord, to continue glowing for you. In your name we prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, children. Back to your seats. Next up is Nicole for our meditational. I've already had a little listen. It's going to be wonderful. Nicole, do you want to come forward? I see you hydrating. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I've got so much to thank God for so many wonderful blessings and so many open doors a brand new mercy along with each new day that's why i praise you and for this This morning, for starting me on my way, for letting me see the dawning of a brand new day, for brand new mercies you give to me each day. That's why. Praise you for this. I I give you oh for every mountain you brought me over, Lord. Oh for every trial you have seen me through.
Another hearty event for Nicole's. Thank you for sharing a gift with us. That was really beautiful. For all these things, we give God praise. The next voice you're going to hear is that of Ruel. She's going to be our speaker for today. And you may have seen Ruel on the gram lifting heavy weights in the gym, giving us the gains. Um, but today, she's going to be lifting something even heavier, the word of God, to fill us up and fill us spiritually today. So thank you again for sharing with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd first like to play a quick video, if that's okay. Can we turn off the lights? Thanks. One sec, just waiting for the sound. Do you love me? Um, that's the title of my sermon. And the reason that I chose that video is because it really reminds me of how sometimes we're so small and God's love for us is so big. And it's so big, big, so big that it's difficult for us to sometimes comprehend. Now, the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to tell them that Jesus loves them. But... I want you to say it with the same level of conviction that you believe it for yourself. And I want you to do the same thing to the person on the other side, but give it the conviction that you believe it over your own life. Sometimes I feel like we make that statement, Jesus loves you, but do we really understand the depth of it? Do we understand that breadth of the love of God? Now, I want someone in the audience to tell me a story, keep it brief, as when you felt the presence of the love of God in your life. Anyone, or maybe two people, but keep it brief if you can. <laughs> A time when you've actually felt the presence of God. Yep. Um, when I was finishing my 18th year, I encountered the message of the Bible. And I was wholeheartedly convicted by the grace of God that I should follow it. And at that time, I had never lived apart from my family and they were farmers. So their business was to raise all kinds of livestock and sell it on. One of the things we did every Friday, dad would slaughter a few pigs. And every Sabbath morning we went, every Saturday morning we went to the market 
to sell them. And I was their main trader. So I was dealing with customers, weighing, counting the money, and basically giving change. Uh, my dad was the butcher. He was cutting the cuts of meat, you know. And my mom was there basically supervising that nobody steals anything. And um, of course, when I encountered this message, I very quickly found that I felt I really wanted to uphold the law of God. And I was told by my parents it was impossible. And because I had never been an independent human being and experienced life, it felt like it felt like an impossibility. And I said, Lord, I can see that you want me to do this. So I stand, but you make it happen. And there were so many persecutions and so many everything, cursing, shouting, which wasn't uncommon from my father, but it was a level higher. Whipping, literally just the last whipping I got from my dad, I was already 19, sleeping because it was so hot in summertime. He just dragged me out of bed. I was totally, as I was born, and he gave me a good lashing with his belt. That's the last time, thank God, my husband doesn't give me whipping, so I, I, never, I never received any more punishments like that. But um, yeah, I experienced, at that time, I experienced such a tremendous peace and literally like God was holding me I had it was so I could have gone you know I could have gotten so stressed by it because to think back now what I had to go through I don't know if I could do it now to be honest after being with God for over 20 years but at that time God had a gift of such trust that if he wants me to do this I just let him do it for me, and he will do it. And he has done amazing things, so we can really trust the power of God. Amen. That was really powerful. How much um, a standing in truth of the love of God can really impact you and the things that you do in your life. Um, I'm going to read to you a definition of love, and this is my favorite definition of love. And when you hear this definition, I want you to, as I read this definition, I want you to really think about what I'm actually saying and what I'm describing through this definition of love, okay? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast and it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it does not keep records of wrongdoings. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in truth. It always protects. Love always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. God is love. You can almost read that text and replace the word love with God because God is love. And every single attribute and characteristic of God that is detailed within that text is directly speaking to the character of who he is. Now, God made us perfectly. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And even though we live in a fallen world, it's really hard sometimes to see his outpouring of love in the world. I mean, just this week, we saw people giving love who lost their life because they wanted to allow the Holy Spirit to use them to give love to those who are in need. Look at that. And look at the world that we live in. There's so much misery. And sometimes it feels like you cannot see the presence of God's love in the world. But God is so good because he has 
tied himself to us through so many intricate, complex structures in our life so that we are able to see the demonstration of the outpouring of his love in society and in the world. So for example, our families, the people that are around us, nature itself, the fact that as human beings, if we were a smidgen closer to the sun, we wouldn't have survived or be surviving on this planet. The complex structures that are involved in oxygen that we breathe and the food that we eat, like there's so many bits of evidence of the presence of God's love and outpouring on this earth, but it's very difficult to see it in a world of so much negativity. And not only that, we also live ex human experiences. We live life, we absorb trauma, we absorb situations. We have different things that happen to us that also affect our perspective and our understanding and how we perceive God and the love that he has. So the first text that I wanna read is actually found in Ephesians 2, verse four to five. And it says that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Because of his great love for us, the sacrifice that he made for, human, for humanity, we are able to live this life and be saved because of what God has done. That's the depth of his love, the sacrifice of his son. Now, I wanna tell you a story about a young man who was newly devoted to his Christian faith. He was brimming with zeal and excited with this enthusiasm. He decided to join his local church on an, evangel an evangelism and witnessing opportunity. Now, while he was on this opportunity, while he was out evangelizing and witnessing to the community, the Holy Spirit encouraged him to speak to a stranger that he saw. Um, he decided to go over and have a conversation with the stranger and talk about his experience and why he decided to follow Jesus and talk about the love of God. Um, the stranger actually was really intrigued by this encounter and the stranger asked the young man, he said, why have you chosen Christianity? Why have you chosen Jesus? And reflecting on his conviction, the young man confidently said, I've chosen Jesus because Jesus suffered and died for me. His physical sacrifice of enduring immense pain and that death on the cross demonstrates his profound love for humanity and that's the reason that I choose to serve him. Now, I don't know if you think that's a good answer or not, but the stranger decided to challenge his thoughts. The stranger said, listen, if all it takes is a willingness to suffer physical pain for a few hours and die in order to be a loving savior, I could be your savior and you could be mine. In fact, let me tell you something else. Didn't Peter get crucified upside down? Does that make him a savior too? What about Paul? His head was chopped off. All those Christian martyrs that were burnt at the stake. What about them? What about that excruciating pain? Lots of people have suffered lots of pain for many good reasons. How does pain and death equate to saviorhood and God's love? I follow, well not me, but the guy in the story. <laughs> He said, um, I follow a deity, a modern deity that is a reincarnation of love. And he's the true embodiment of love. And if I told you his story, he was uh, tied to a beam, upside down, and burnt alive. That's my savior. His experience was way more excruciating than yours. So how does God's love equate to physical suffering? This encounter prompted some true reflection about the narrative of God's love revolving around one element of that story, the physical suffering that perpetuates the notion that pain equates to divine affection. Yet, does Jesus' suffering truly encapsulate the depths of God's love? 
Teachings frequently emphasize the physical torment, which is only one element of his love demonstrated, and that in turn can ingrain a skewed perception of divine love. Could this focus on suffering inadvertently diminish the breadth and the depth of our understanding of God's love for us? Now, according to the Washington Times, um, and this is something that I think all dads out there need to listen to, it's common for children to perceive the characteristics of God as the fatherly figures that they have in their lives. So if you, as a fatherly figure in a child's life, are caring and patient and concerned and demonstrate that, that is the basis, the first basis of understanding in which children are able to develop their perception of the characteristics of God. And also the same holds opposite. If somebody grows up maybe with an absent father or someone who's very harsh or judgmental, that is the formed basis of their perception and understanding of God as they grow through life. And that's one mitigating factor. Ellen G. White says in Steps to Christ that the enemy has blinded the eyes of men so that they look at God with fear, thinking of severe, him as severe and unforgiving. Satan has deceived the world into believing that God's chief attribute is stern justice, even though the Bible clearly says that God's chief attribute is love. Do you not see how subjective how our understanding of the depth of God's love for us is subjective to so many different mitigating factors. Number one, your experience and understanding as a child growing up and what that felt like. And then number two, Satan's deception of the world, trying to paint a scary and frightening image of God so that people do not feel like they can be close to him and come to him. These subjective understandings can really affect the narratives that we tell ourselves and that we understand of ourselves and how God's love interacts with us. Now, if your narrative is negative, God is love, and your narrative of that God is negative, a God of stern justice that is absent from love, absent from forgiveness, then that's what your perception of love will be like. Will you accept that for yourself? Is that how you treat yourself? Because that's the perception of love that you have. God is love. And the way you see God is the way you see love. The way that you understand God's love is the way that you love yourself. The way that you treat others. Our understanding of love needs to transcend mere suffering and it needs to encompass a boundless compassion of God's love and grace. Now, love is an action word which requires the giver of love to complete an action. God is love, and he's the giver of love. So God, as the giver, gave love himself to us. That is the ultimate depth of the boundless love that God has for humanity. And my understanding about God's love has definitely had to develop somewhat over the years because a lot, of, a lot of it was focused on God's sacrifice and the physical endurance of pain that he had to go through. But in reality, that kind of skewed my perception and it made me associate God's sacrifice and God's love with pain and persecution. And that's a skewed perception. That's a skewed perception. These can actually turn into physical strongholds of the mind and prevent you from being able to receive the love of God in the depth that it really has because of some of these narratives. So if I was to rename my sermon, I would actually call it love narratives, the stories that we tell ourselves, the things that we say about God, who is love. That's what I would call it. Now, sometimes the wrong narratives of God's love can make our experience very unbearable. If we can turn to Romans 2 verse 5, and it says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. 
Each of us will encounter God where he unveils his face and unveils his true character, but not everybody will be able to see the same things. Let me explain. Those of us who have trusted and accepted Jesus as the Son of God and his gift of salvation will see infinite mercy. We will be able to bear it because we understand the true depth of God's grace and mercy. This motivates change and this motivates uh, transformation because we can accept the infinite gift of mercy. However, some people will not be able to bear this because God's grace, mercy, and love shine so brightly. It's such a contrast with the narratives that they've believed about God's character, which are contrary to the actual expression of his love. I'll give you an example. Have you ever had someone tell you something about someone and gossip and gossip and gossip and gossip and you've never met the person, but they're telling you this narrative about who this person is? And then when you meet the person in real life, it's very contrary to the perception that has been painted for you prior to meeting that person. That's how it is when it comes down to be to people being unable to accept God's love. That's how unbearable it is. It's such a contrast between the narratives that you tell yourself and the things that have been ingrained for such a long time in your life. And if you also think about this, the enemy's intent to paint God in that way, in a frightening manner, so that people will not be able to access and experience the true depth of God's love for us. These narratives are contrary to the true character of God. So the first point that I want to make this morning is don't let false, negative, unhelpful narratives cause you to reject the love of God because you're sat in self-condemnation because of what you've been telling yourself. Psalms 139 verse 8 says, If I go up to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my beds in the depths, you are also there. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what narratives you tell yourself. God is every single place that you are. Remind yourself to reject the notion that any suffering you experience is somehow justified because Christ suffered. That's not what it is. Don't let that suffering notion be a prerequisite prerequisite for you experiencing and embracing the love of God. Embrace the truth that God's love transcends human comprehension and extends beyond suffering and encompasses mercy, forgiveness, and also grace. The second thing that I want to talk about is the narrative of God's love and the effect it has on our experience with God and that sense of separation. I want to turn quickly to Romans 20, verse 11. And it says, not Romans, sorry, Revelations 20, verse 11. And it says, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. There was no place for them. That's quite terrifying to be in the presence of God and feel like there's no place for you, like you can't be there. Sometimes this happens through a sense of separation. When we feel like we have maybe walked too far away from God and we can't really get back, or when we sometimes feel like we may have gone, but may have been so busy with our lives that we've created a sense of separation between God and between us. And sometimes it actually can feel like there's no place for you. That distant feeling because of trauma, because of life, because of sin. Sometimes you feel embarrassed to go back to God, don't you? You feel like it's been too much time in between the last time I spoke to him and now. And despite the fact that I really need to do this, I just don't feel like I can. I just feel separated from him. This sense of separation can definitely be a tool for the enemy because those empty spaces are then filled with other narratives that feed other ideas about your relationship with God. And that sense of distance continues to grow and it grow and grow. Now, some of you might know I work out a lot. And when you commit yourself to like a routine or a goal or something like that, 
If you miss a day, then it's okay. You usually can pick yourself back up. That separation between you and what you were doing, your routine, your goal, hasn't really been that intense. But when that separation grows and grows and grows, even though the gym is still in the same place you left it and all the equipment is right there, you are the one that feels separated from that thing that was there all along. In the same sense, sometimes that separation that we feel from God when we're in those experiences, it does kind of feel like there's a distance and there's a lack of love. But the best thing to do is just get up and go back to the gym. Get up and go straight to God. Your separation from him is something that's easily overcome. In fact, God's love extends so deeply that it doesn't matter how many times we are separated. The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. In the same way that our ideas of God's love can be formed by narratives and experiences that we have in our life and can create a sense of safe separation, it's important for us to turn, come to our senses, turn around and say, I'm going to go back straight away. I'm going to and I'm going to absorb the love of God. I'm going to accept the love of Jesus over my life. I'm not going to allow this separation to affect me. Look at the prodigal son, Luke 15. Finally, when he came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food and enough to spare. And here I am dying. I will go home to my father. In the same way that we sometimes might feel separated from the love of God, sometimes it's just a requirement to turn around and go back to God. I'm just going to read uh, Romans 8 verse 39. And it says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything? Who dares accuse us, whom God has chosen his own? No one, God, no, no one for God himself has given us right standing with himself. For who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus has died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in place to honor, sitting in, sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we are in trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sake, we are, for your sake, we are um, killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor fears of today or worries of tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. There is no separation between you and the love of God. And I finally want to just talk a little bit about love, God's love and the impact that it has on sin. Um, Revelations 20 verse 12 says, and I saw the dead, great, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out, not out of those things which were written, but according to their works. Imagine being face to face with the ugly reality of sin, completely unfiltered, completely unimaginable. Now, on top of that, imagine the weight, sorry, imagine being face to face with the weight of sin, but also the horrendous picture of absolutely no mercy, no grace, no concept of forgiveness, no sense of repentance. That weight of sin that crushes the soul and really affects us. But 
It's because of the love of God that we don't have to face that horrendous picture of no mercy, no grace, or forgiveness. And one thing that I really want to stress this morning as well is how important it is for not only us to change the narratives in our mind about the love of God, break down strongholds and false misinformations that the devil likes to put out there about God, but also we must make sure that we are able to be used as empty vessels to pour into others that are out there and so that God can use us to share his love to the world. So I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about a personal experience of mine and about how the, f the first time that I could notably really say that I felt the love of God in my life. So um, as I was growing up as a child, I definitely would say, well, I have ADHD. So as a child, it definitely is a challenge for parents who have young children. And I'm sure that my dad doesn't have hair today because it was because of a lot of my behavior. <laughs> but growing up, um, with, growing up with ADHD, it was really difficult for me because I constantly had narratives in my mind about not being good enough, always being in trouble. What have you done wrong now? People with ADHD are always in trouble. <laughs> and they get told off a lot as they grow up. So as you become an adult, certain ways of thinking become ingrained and they affect you in everything that you do. So as an adult, the way that ADHD has affected me is it's made me extremely self-critical of myself. It's made me really frustrated with myself all the time. You know, I can never get a break mentally. Sometimes people, that's why I'm always in the gym because it's the only place to get that kind of like intensity out of my mind. And that same telling off that you would get as a child for your behavior, you do that to yourself on everything. And it's really hard to experience the love of God when you're in those, in, in those situations because also it's like a chemical imbalance as well, right? But that's something that I used to do, tell myself off so much all the time about everything. And in 2020, it was probably the lowest year of my life and it was the worst, it was definitely the worst year of my life. And, um, a lot of negative experiences, a lot of trauma, and also then my way of regulating myself and looking out for myself was really not very good. And it put me in a place where I was really at the lowest place of my life and in some really deep depression. And the problem with me as well is that I like to keep a lot of those types of things inside so I don't go out and seek help as they say that you should. And I was dealing with that internally, keeping it in, holding it down every single day. And my parents, like, they never like push too much for you to divulge what's going on. But sometimes they have an inkling as to if something's not really working out for you. And so I remember my mum and dad coming to see me because they were quite concerned about my mental health. And where it's weird because where I was expecting to maybe be told off, even though that was just a, a mental thing, but where I was looking for a behavioral correction, my parents actually just cuddled me, sat down, and showed, just sat with me and listened and let me speak about everything that I was experiencing. They didn't say anything. They didn't give me advice. They didn't try and, and I told them some things and I think they might have had eyebrows raised, but they didn't do anything. They just sat there and allowed me to get it all out. That for me was the first time in a long time that I had experienced love, the love of God through them because it was really, a moment where I felt accepted entirely, flaws and all, by my mum and dad. And I felt like that was also God showing me that he also loves and accepts me exactly like this too. And whatever we're going through, we're going to deal with it together. That experience was like a catapult into transform transformative healing, mental um, healing of my mind, and healing of some areas of my life that definitely needed work. But it was the love of God shown through my parents that enabled me to even make that step to 
transform my thinking and my understanding about the depth of God's love in my life. And I really, really want to encourage you today that God's love is transforming. Despite your shortcomings, God's love extends to grace, it extends to mercy, it extends to forgiveness. It is unconditional. When you feel, when you feel overwhelmed, God embraces us with his love. So if you're ever in any situation where you don't feel the depth of God's love, you can just ask God to show it to you. I remember, um, Leah, you were saying that you used to find those hearts everywhere, which was like God showing you that he's there, he's listening, he loves you. Like challenge him like that. Sometimes it's hard to experience the love of God in this world, but he's connected to us. And the narratives that we tell ourselves are at the center of our transforming understanding of the love of God. Now, before we pray, I want to ask anybody, again, if they've got a story where they felt the transforming power of the love of God over their life, any situations that they've been in that we can draw encouragement from this morning. Cameron, do you want to? Hi there, everyone. Um, so the time that I've felt the love of God, right? Um, I'd have to say it'd be when I met the person who invited me to Parkside, which was Jermaine, who is f coincidentally not here at the moment. Um, through his invitation, which at the time I wasn't exactly particularly believing of any certain religion, but was open to the idea. Um, through accepting his invite and uh, interacting with everybody, I met a lot of different people and um, was invited to certain events, um, even given work by some people, um, which through accepting, I went to um, a certain film studio in Uxbridge, it escapes me, but um, just for one day, um, but having accepted the invite, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have experienced some really life altering and uplifting moments with people that I only briefly encountered. So yeah, the, the first time I ex really truly experienced that love of God was through meeting Jay and then so on and so forth. All of the encounters I've had through Parkside have been utmost. Thank you. Amen. Is there anybody else who has a story to share this morning about a time in which they have experienced a level of love from God that maybe they didn't feel before or maybe they hadn't experienced? No? Well, that's okay. Um, oh, you do? Okay. So I was alone, I was crying, and it's like when you're crying out to God and you need help. I opened my Bible and I found Jeremiah 31 verse 3. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with love and kindness I have drawn you. And finding that Bible at that specific point in time, it just let me know, you could be alone. Like, sometimes we need, we love people, people are great, but God loves you and he will find you even when you're alone. If you, he loves you more than anyone else, and it meant the world to me. So, yeah. Mm. Amen. That's really powerful. Just understanding sometimes, even when you're alone, that actually God loves you so much, and it actually means the world to Him that you're even spending time with Him, speaking to Him. He's waiting literally for us to transform the way that we think. This message today 
if you don't get anything else from it, I am hoping that we change our mindset and change the narratives that we tell ourselves about how deeply God loves us. He really, really, really does. And Satan has gone out of his way to really make the narrative scary sometimes, like, oh, you sinned. Well, um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, you did this wrong. Oh, checking for your behavior. Oh, checking for what you're doing. Oh, I'm checking how you're living. Like, that's the devil. Satan's love, Satan's love, God's love, sorry, is so much deeper than what you're doing, how you're doing it. And we, it's hard to accept sometimes, especially when you know what you've been through and your experiences, but it's true and it's really, really deep. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to experience it. But I want to challenge us to change the narratives that we have in our mind about the power and the depth of God's love. I hope that we rest in assurance that God's love, it knows no bounds, and it extends to each of us, not just us as Christians, but every human being on this planet, regardless of past mistakes, present struggles, regardless of religion, regardless of what you believe, regardless of whether you're pro or against, you know, God's love extends to every single person, even those you people you don't really like. <laughs> Got to remind myself of that sometimes. <laughs> but I want to pray right now, and I want to pray over our thinking and our mindset. And I'm going to ask God that any strongholds that we may have in our mind about God's characteristics are broken in the name of Jesus. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here today. I want to thank you, Lord, for showing us how much you love us and showing us how much you love humanity just through the intricate, complex structures that we have in our lives. We're grateful for our families, our friends. We're grateful for our jobs and our experiences. And even though times might be quite difficult right now, cost of living crisis, wars, rumors of wars, we're grateful that we can sit here today and we can be used by you to show your love to others also. Lord, I specifically want to pray against strongholds, mental strongholds, narratives, negative narratives that we tell ourselves about your character and your love. We know that Satan has gone out of his way to distort and skew the image of your love to the whole of humanity. And sometimes that causes separation. Sometimes that makes the true depth of your love feel unbearable. And sometimes we find ourselves with the wrong understandings of the depth of the love that you have for us. So, Lord, I want to pray to break those strongholds. Help us learn a new thing, a new way of thinking about your love. Help us not to be affected by all the different mitigating factors that impact the way that we think about your love. And finally, help us to be humble enough to be able to be used by you to actually pour your love into the world also. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that powerful? Thank you so much, Ruel, for reminding us of the transformative power of God's love that extends not just to those of us in here, but those of our colleagues, our friends, and our families. I really liked what you said about mindset, because that's where it all begins, isn't it? How we treat ourselves, how we treat others, and that's why this series is going to be so powerful, because the Holy Spirit is going to work on our inside to affect how we go out and live in the world. We're glad you joined us here at Parkside. Weren't you glad to be here today? Weren't you glad you didn't miss this message? We really glad that you shared this time with us. So I'm going to invite the praise team to come up. I'm going to invite you to help us pack away. I don't think there are any announcements other than don't forget to validate your parking and hug somebody as you leave. Thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Right, so thank you all.
That was powerful. That was powerful. Um, understanding the depths of God's love, changing our narrative. Um, the final song that we're going to sing is, is a song that, um, it's like a dedication um, and just, just really hammering home um, this message that our lives are in his hands and that we don't have to worry about anything. Um, and we can trust that his love is complete. Um, so as we sing the song, uh, we finished as we sing this as we sing the song. If you can help us to pack the chairs away. Here we go. You don't have to worry. Let's sing. You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. And don't you be afraid. Joy comes in. Joy comes in the morning. Troubles, they won't last Troubles, always. they don't last away. For there's a friend in For Jesus. For there's a friend in Jesus. Who will wipe away. Who will wipe your tears away. And if. And if your heart. Just lift your hands and say. Just lift your hands and say. Oh, I know. Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I. I know that I can stand. No matter. No matter what may come my way. My life is in your hands. I can take it with him I know with him I know I can stand no matter no matter what, what may come may my way, come my way. Okay, I'm feeling this. Let's go. One, two, three.